like you to all raise to your feet and give a big start of grind Limerick welcome to Paul Hayes. You run the PR agency at Beach Hut, yeah. and you're, you're, you're working with tech companies, yeah. the top tech companies in the country yes. and elsewhere. So the bit in between, you know, coming from, from Thurlis and your whole early career, how, tell, us, tell us about it. This, for me, is the highlight of my life. I looked up to Limerick. I wasn't allowed to go to Limerick. I've been barred from Ted's. I mean, like, <laughs> it's just the highlight. This was, I'll tell you a great story, actually. It's not very entrepreneurial, but uh, there was a fella in Thurlis uh, that had no arms, and uh, he was a little boy, baby, and he's now a judge. And uh, he used to drive us to Limerick to go to nightclubs. And it was so good. It was just so much fun up and down this road. But that's not really relevant. Uh, so I'll, I'll work back uh, towards. So I did a, a degree in Greek and Roman because I discovered drink and girls in Dublin uh, when I got there. And that wasn't very good. And it was myself and Ryan Tuberty were the only two lads in Greek and Roman. And there were two unpaid jobs going uh, when we got out. Because obviously as Greek and Roman graduates, there was a huge, you know, the world was our oyster. If the Greeks and the Romans ever come back, we'd be the go-to guys. But in the meantime, uh, and uh, one was in RTE and one was in Fianna Fáil, which is, you know, it's, uh, back then it was grand. It was a perfectly decent job. And uh, we flipped a coin. And I flipped wrong. And ever since, uh, I have been a frustrated chat show host. That's what it is. And he tells me I flipped wrong, you know, on many, many occasions. So ended up in, in, in PR generally, uh, political with drinks, we rehabilitated the image of cider, God help us, we made it all respectable and cool again uh, for boomers and uh, we did Operation Free Flow for the Dublin Transportation Office when John Bruton got stuck in traffic once and got really angry and he was a t-shirt so something had to be done and did all sorts of boring PR and then two guys changed my life, they walked in to a tech PR company I was working for called Text 100, great company and uh, they said we have this little company that does physics engines. We don't know what sector we want to go into yet. We don't know where it's going to happen, but we need to go to this uh, trade show in California and we need someone to come with us. And I said, I've never been to California, but I've seen it on the telly. Uh, this is about 16, 17 years ago. And I thought, this is great. I want to go to California. I have no interest in tech. Still don't. And um, <laughs> I said, I'm going to California. So I went with Steve Collins and, and Hugh Reynolds as they were. And we, we, the name of the company was Telekinesis. So that was a crap name. And it got changed to Havoc. And I stayed at Havoc. Uh, four or five years, six years, I think, in the end. It became the biggest games middleware company uh, in the world. It was great, sold to Intel. It was a really great story. Uh, met two young fellas while I was doing all these game conferences around the world, um, Dylan Collins and Sean Blanchfield, and they had Demonware, so I worked with them for a while. Then I said, ah, I have no interest in games. What am I doing this for? And um, I went off with, uh, to travel the world for a year and made more money out of Beach Huts that year like living in beach huts than anywhere else. So I thought, this is how the world works. This is great. What have I been doing sitting behind a desk? Okay. Uh, and so I started beach hut from a beach hut. Uh, but it doesn't, turns out life isn't like that. Well, anyway. So while you were with Havoc and Demonware, yeah. you did some interesting guerrilla marketing in uh, yeah. the West Coast. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, uh, and failure has been a kind of a constant through my life, uh, you know, but trying to turn it around. So I'd never been to California and the lads had raised two million punts and uh, that's how long ago it was. And I said, well, we need to build a trade stand at this game developers conference in San Jose. By the way, whoever's been to San Jose, don't go. I don't know why they wrote a song about it. It's the arsehole of the world. But it's, a, you know, it's the bottom of Silicon Valley. It's, it's, yeah, it is what it is. But I spent a lot of time there in the McInerney Convention Center. Anyway, I spent half a million punts on this stand and I put it between the Microsoft and the Sony stand because Microsoft are bringing out this thing called the Xbox and Sony were, you know, they were on their PlayStation 2 at that stage. I thought, this is the place to be. Turns out they'd spent like five million each on their stands. So our half million made it look like a shanty town. People were just going, oh, that's embarrassing. That's not right. Got no business, got no nothing. And I'd wasted all the mo company's money. So they said, they should have fired me. And luckily they didn't. Came close, I think. Um, and uh, they said, right, you now have no money. What would you do? So we couldn't even afford tickets to trade shows. So I started just uh, doing what any Irish person would do, which is buying beers in bars. And then we got a little bit more fanciful where we would park. We couldn't afford hotels. We couldn't afford tickets to the show. So we started hiring RVs uh, for three days, parking them in the car park of the, the big conventions and putting laptops and trays of beer on them. And it turns out, accidentally, I discovered people hate trade shows. They don't want to be at them. They just want to be at them to meet their mates and go to the parties. And if they find out that there's Irish lads in the car park with beer and they can sit down for half an hour, we sold up the wazoo. I swear to God, that was 110 million exit, and it all came from being in, in uh, RVs in the back of car parks. So I made a feature of it. Then when we got more money, I started doing 
trolley cars in San Francisco and red London buses in LA around the Staples Centre for E3 and then, you know, hot air balloons and now it got stupid like. Uh, it then, uh, Enterprise Ireland had a conniption one year because I can't remember what company it was, but we hired a yacht in Cannes. And no amount of, it does this, like we slept on the yacht, we had our meetings on the yacht, we had our parties on the yacht, it was our branding. It would have cost a hundred grand to build a shitty little stand in the Palais de Congrès inside. It would have cost 10 grand for hotels in Cannes for five people, you know, or whatever. 10 grand to hire the yacht, but of course you can't do that if you're, you know, like it's taxpayer money. Whatever. Well, it wasn't even, they were just investors. But uh, anyway, that was where it all kind of, the wheels came off. But it was a great show. And so I spent 10 years basically before I had kids and before everything else, just traveling around the world. My only philosophy is people remember shag all of what you say. They remember how you made them feel. That's all they remember. And if, if they remember a positive feeling towards how they made you feel, they're going to take, they're going to do business with you. They're going to, they'll take the half hour meeting where you give them the boring bit on your features and benefits and, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. It's not about the tech. Oh, I'm sure it is. I'm sure the engineers in the room will tell right. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's handy if the tech worked, but at least four of the big six tech companies I worked for in-house didn't have tech that worked, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They bought some little shitty startup that did. And, right, uh, right. and let that be, you know, your lesson. Just stay in the game, because there's some company out there that looks like they have lots of money and they don't know how the tech works, and you probably do. Um, so you kind of had a, had, a, had a natural knack for the PR piece. Yeah, I think so. Despite being yourself and gregarious and what you learn, Irish guy. What you learn in a pub, uh, you know, on, a, on the square in Thurles during the Munster final. It's like, <laughs> and that's not like Ray McSherry. I learned it all at the mark from my father at the thing, but actually... That's, that's what it is. I mean, it, it's, it's, there's an overwhelming <clears throat> human need for connection. And I think that's all we've been doing. And it, and it actually, without getting too convoluted about it, it, that's our philosophy of PR. It's make a connection with a journalist, make a connection with a storyteller, but make it about something bigger than yourself. Never sell yourself, sell them a good story. The number one mistake people make on PR, and especially in tech PR, is they're the equivalent of the person who walks into a pub and goes, oh yeah, I'm great. That's what sending a press release out saying, I exist, or I just raised money, or whatever. That's the equivalent of walking into a pub going, I'm great. You want to walk into the pub and go, did you see what's going on in the world? Did you see Trump, and then the other thing, and the other thing, and the other thing. And at the end of the night, the whole pub comes to the conclusion, geez, those guys are great. Because they educated us, they, they delighted us, they, they gave us insight into what was going on, and much like the startup grind philosophy, give first. They weren't looking for something. Be a great source. Be a great source on something that's bigger than yourself. Never tell your own story. Tell a bigger story that you can be the proof of. What's the function of a press release then, and when should it be used? Two times only. When you've raised money or you've got a customer, because that answers 99% of, of people's questions. And then also recognize that sending a press release out actually diminishes relationships as much as enhances them. And by that I mean, we have a philosophy. Write a press release and then resist the temptation to send it. Come in! And uh, that's just the friendliest bank in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, is that the pub delivering the pints? <laughs> pizza um it, it's and by that i mean i have this rule there's I have lots of rules that i just made up tonight for you uh there are seven journalists in any market that count and that's the same in limerick as it is in dublin as it is in new york as it is in uh, silicon valley and they tend to be you know two dailies two sundays a radio a tv a, a, a tech press and then a specialist trade tech press in your sector you can't physically, no matter how big or how much you spend on PR, or if you're doing it yourself, and everyone should do it for themselves first, uh, we are a waste, a monumental waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> Only when you get to a certain scale. Um, you cannot maintain viable relations with more than seven press at any one time. Now, you can send press releases to the whole world and where it might get picked up and whatever, and they will print your quite boring news, unless you are Apple or someone already, because you're big and where you go. You need to maintain viable relations with seven different types of press. You have to come up with seven different angles. 80% of the story will be the same, but they all have to have a different angle because journalists write for their editors and they write trend stories. They're, they're like, I, I always see journalists as VCs with no money and they're usually better at it. Good. Maybe it's easier when you don't have to invest money at the end. They're trying to separate the hot sectors from the cold sectors, the big trends from the small trends that aren't going to stick, and then who are the proof points within that. Always be in the third paragraph of the story, never be in the headline. You can be in the headline once. If I see you in the headline twice, 
you're at nothing. You're hurting yourself. Yeah, and the Sunday business, on Sunday Independent last week, I read about the Web Summit, and there was a few paragraphs about interesting startups, and then the last paragraph is about you having a party in a barber's. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about that. Well, obviously, I'm follically unchallenged <laughs> as we speak. Uh, okay, so that's an odd one. Um, they, the, <laughs> uh, we're talking about failure, uh, and I guess where it comes from. The early Web Summit, um, there was a load of us that were kind of half hosting it and half helping out. It was Pat Phelan and, uh, and Mark Little and myself and Noel Toulon and uh, Dylan Collins, actually, and a few more. And when it came to the kind of elite speakers dinner inside in Hogwarts in the Trinity Dining Hall, which I'd never been in, uh, the door was, it was full. So they shut the door on us. That was the and founders. That was founders, yeah. the first founders. Yeah, yeah. And in a fit of peak, we went, well, if we're not good enough for you, we'll have our own club. So we, we formed a club called Flounders for failed founders. And we went up the road and we all got drunk. And Flounders has now paralleled Founders. So it, it got, no, it never got quite as big yeah, as Webster. Yeah, it has, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was 500 people on a boat at the last one that was in Dublin. And then the first one in Lisbon, uh, and the price of admission is you have to tell a failure story. Because actually, successes are usually boring. I mean, they're great and it's wonderful and we should all strive for success, but they're usually interesting only in that one particular way and uh, you can only tell that story once, whereas how you fucked up, that's marvellous. That's, you know, <laughs> I can relate to that. I want you to tell me that. I'm going to learn from that and where you get to. So Flounders has kind of been, you've got to tell your, and it can't just be the humble brag of, oh my God, I only made five billion this year. Or, you know, uh, it's got to be really raw where it all went wrong. But we're all drunk as loons. And... Uh, Actually, Declan Ryan of, of GPA and Ryan, who started the propeller uh, thing out in Shannon yeah. today, he came along to one of the flounders and said, this is wonderful, but you're all too drunk. No one's remembering anything. There's nothing there. So he kind of came up with the concept of the startup wake. So now I go around the world burying startups. And it's like a, we, we at least start sober. So we, you know, there's a structure. I'm a priest. There's three dead startups. Their investors have to come and forgive them. It's all very, you're like, I... Catholic messed up childhood, but it's wonderful <laughs> to be able to, like, I mean, as the son, uh, one of them yeah, yeah, as, as the son of a publican, like, I am a professional funeral goer, like, you know, as long as you're not too close to the deceased, yeah. funerals are much better crack than weddings, you know, you can drink as much as you want, stay as long as you want, get to where you want to get to, you know, it is, yeah, but within reason, um, so we've done startup wakes now all around the world, and it's been fantastic, Texas, London, Cork, uh, Cork, <laughs> We have no one in Limerick. We should no, Limerick next. 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 Yeah. So the one I was at was in, uh, in, in Rhine Academy. Was, I don't yeah. know, was that the that first, was the first or second one? one. Yeah. And it was Dave, Jamie Heaslip was the priest. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. And there were some monumental failures, like big failures. And yeah. people were really honest. And it seemed very cathartic. And the investors were standing up in the audience and yeah. giving sort of absolution. Yeah, that kind so, of is the asshole test. You know, if your investors are willing to forgive you after they've wasted all their money, it's kind of a good sign. Yeah. You know, and they want to back you again. They want you to go so again. So after doing it there once, how did, they, how did it progress into London and, and, and Austin, Texas? And it was really, it's whenever, I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't want to be flippant about it completely. Failure is hard and it can be very personally detrimental and it can get there. So usually about six to nine months in, after they failed, <laughs> I go, you should talk about this. It's important for you. We should purge it. And you're usually onto your next big thing. So you're using it as a platform. What are you going to do next? Yeah. Right? You've gotten over your own grieving process and where it's going to go. So it's really like I love mentoring startups um, and we do that all over the world and we do it through academies and everything else. So not all of them make it. In fact, the majority don't make it. But now, as people, they're all going to be fine, I tell them. Most of you are not going to make it in your current incarnation in terms of what you're trying to do, especially if you're venture-backed, because you're meant to go for moonshots and, you know, what you're going to do. Um, but as individuals, you're all going to be fine. You know, the fact you've taken this step into a startup means you're going to, whatever you end up doing, you're going to be great. You know, the, the guide rails are off and you're not worried Actually, about it anymore. Declan Ryan was speaking today at an event in Shannon, the propeller incubator, and somebody spoke about some failure. He was giving his whole CV and he kind of, Glossed over some big failure. He said, hold on, go back, back. Show the scars. Investors want to see the scars. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Um, Actually, GPA is amazing. Yeah. Like two, what is it? A, a, over half or nearly two thirds of the world's aircraft because of the most monumental so failure yeah. of all time. Because a load of 25 year olds went bust in their mid 20s. It doesn't scare them. You know, they lost because they all, you know, doubled down to, you know, buy the shares and do the stuff. It was the most amazing creative destruction that ever happened in this region. Yeah. And it's, it's spawned from there. Now I know it's 20 years later, you know, in terms of where it gets to, but I can't wait for a huge tech company to fail. Like, you know, Google needs to spit out five or six engineers, not Google, but you know, whoever, yeah. you know, or pull out or where it gets to. Like I'm, I'm amazed by here as well. Like I was in Hollywood, mind my, I'm gonna name drop now, mind your toes. I was interviewing the last, the, the last Jedi director in LA two weeks ago and uh, he was quietly saying, and a load of them, that Troy Studios, which 
as I understand it, is Dell, right? Or what? The old Dell plant. Yeah, yeah the old yeah. Dell. Like, AST and Samsung, what's whatever. What's going on there? Like, yeah. you know, when the director of Star Wars is going, we've got some projects. Yeah. We're looking at some, and you're going, Jesus, okay. And I mean, that was Dell, what, two and a half, three years ago? Like, how long is it a, a studio? Yeah. Um, it's phenomenal in terms of the destruction. Anyway, not yeah. my, it's above my pay grade. I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm Tom and the Godfather. I'm a consigliere. I'm a wartime consigliere. I, I'm the guy to be in the trench beside you. I am not an entrepreneur, and here's why. I can't tolerate the ambiguity. I need guide rails. 90% of us want security. Only 10% of the mad lunatic entrepreneurs, and I'm looking out at the audience here, can cope with the freedom that entrepreneurialism brings, or the lack of guidelines, the lack of structure, the lack of, okay, I've hit this point now, I've hit this point now. I've hit. You don't know. You feel like your company's bending towards success, but you haven't got a clue, because normally in this environment, you're doing something so new that it, there are no rules for it. You know, if you're really trying to disrupt something or you're really trying to get to it, that would drive me demented. I mean, there's something wrong with entrepreneurs. Thank God. Uh, you know, I mean, they are wired differently to the rest of us. And I realized early on, having hanging out, I mean, it's, a, it's an honor to be adjacent to entrepreneurs. But I realized immediately, I am okay. not them. I cannot be them. Just to go back to the um, way, because I think that's really important. Right. You obviously kind of cornered the failure market now. Oh, I have, yeah, yeah. In, in, in curating it, now, huge failure. Um, so Flounders was brilliant, but the the, the wake um, you brought it to London and you brought it to Austin. Yeah. Did, did they understand the wake idea? Oh yeah, it's fairly universal. Yeah? Is it? I think okay. it is. I think it is. You know that we're going to mourn our dead here. That it's there. I mean, we okay. do we do it a little bit more, you know. Uh, Wildly. Wildly, yeah. yeah. We tried to, at the first one, we tried to burn the business plan, but you're not allowed to burn things inside buildings anymore for health and safety okay. reasons. Jesus, the many stage. So now we, uh, thanks to Teeling Whiskey, uh, we uh, sink a shot of whiskey at the end and sing the parting glass, which is really naff, but actually it gets really emotional for these because they've normally put three, five, seven years of their lives into what they're doing. Okay. And the problem is nobody ever admits failure. They go, I'm just working on that. You know, like that's in the bottom drawer. I'm going to come back to it. I call bullshit. You need to move on. In fact, I don't think you should be allowed to do another startup in Ireland until you officially bury your last startup because it's better psychologically for you and it's just clean. You know, it's done. It's yeah. gone. It's not coming back and it's okay. I'm going to move on to the next thing. But I, I do, I, we do it as a joke because it's hard to get people to open up emotionally yeah. about what was like probably one of the toughest things in their lives. Um, and we've had a lot of tears and whatever. But if you don't do the jokey bit, no one's going to turn up. Uh, you know, that's the kind of permission and we put a bit of theatre around it and uh, Usher look at the first we did a coffin in uh, London and the undertaker comes in and he goes uh, yeah it says here we have to collect this coffin tomorrow that's a first <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is so that classic difference that you know especially in the valley that there's mm. such an acceptance a respect for failure and in Ireland like it's like you know it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a shameful thing is yeah. that changing I don't know I hope it is I, I hope it is I, you know there's there's two types of failure, though. There's the, you know, Jesus, you, you know, you were a Muppet. You, you had that coming. Then there's the, we tried something huge and it didn't work. And that's a 51-49 call, you know, in terms of... So even I've been guilty of judging some people going, ah, that was just, you know, they should never have been... And then I'm going, you have to catch yourself and go, if we can talk about how, I suppose, you know, you're never going to get it right on the first time. Even VCs and investors will say... We want, to back, we want to back the person after they've messed up once or twice. That seems to be the big difference. Now, maybe it's just that we're two and a half cycles into VC here and they're five and a half cycles in in the valley and three and a half or four in. We'll see it evolve as it, as it keeps going. Um, it's, it's fascinating, though, in terms of what you need to be able to publicly purge. You need to be able to get the support of your peers because what will crush you is if you keep your failure to yourself and it's just the whispers then. It's the whatever. It's amazingly cathartic when you do it, like I'm proud that we actually do it, as big a piss take and all as it is, and we're all drunk on whiskey by the end of the night and we're hugging and crying and laughing and whatever else, but it's getting founders as well to be honest with each other is amazing. You know, was it the market? Was it, it all starts with, it was the market, product market fit, it was the time, it was the whatever. No, it was you, you bastard. You didn't turn up to that meeting and you didn't do the other thing and it didn't get to, and it's never that either, but they need to work through that right. to get to, sorry, this sounds very Oprah, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> I just believe in the emotion of business because in the end, I don't take business that seriously. Like the, anyone that takes business too seriously is kind of missing the point of life. Like it's a means to an end. It's a means to a better life. And if you can, no, I'm, I haven't figured it out yet, but I, I think sometimes you just need to, Unwind. So you're dealing with lots of the top tech companies in Ireland, right? Yeah. So is it public who your clients are? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not like a 
dodgy Great lobbyists Great company around us, or anything. anything. Barry Lunn is my favourite client on the planet. He tried to pick a fight. So I don't know if anyone was here for Barry, who's from Limerick, the last talk. He tried to fight Vladimir Klitschko in Lisbon a week ago. He flew in for eight hours and picked a fight with the heavyweight champion of the world. <laughs> it was like, that's Limerick by. That's Limerick City <laughs> right there. And he was just a lunatic. But he's, he's a guy who's phenomenally creative, has very little formal, like he jokes. I, like he tells me he didn't get his insert. And I don't know whether to take him seriously or not. Probably not. And now he's building like next stage aerospace sensors for like everyone. And it's, it's just what he's doing is phenomenal. Phenomenal. So those companies are, are great clients to have, but say yep. for early stage startups here now, do they yep. need do they need to hire no. a PR agency? No. Can they do it themselves? They, what do it. What they tip, have to do it themselves. What tips would you give them? Okay, here's the here's the top tip. So it's you, not they couldn't afford you starters, right? I am very cheap. My company, stupidly expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I personally very cheap. Uh, no, because you know, you have to be able to sell your own story first. It's not authentic to you, you, really all we are is traffic cops. Can we bring you to more things? Can we help you maybe, you know, polish the story a bit, but really just bring you to more outlets? That's all we are. When you break it down, it's not that. It, it's, it's laborious and it's old school and it is based on relationships rather than, because you can send a press release anywhere. Actually, someone just frightened the shit out of me today by saying under GDPR, which is the most boring thing in the world, you know, the, the, cause you missed out on Y2K, you youngsters, you're going to get GDPR. No, no, and this is just one thing, and, and actually I don't see it necessarily as a negative in, uh, in terms of what I'm about to go. You will not be allowed to send a press release to anyone you don't know under GDPR because it's unsolicited spam, spam well, yeah. on, the, on the thing. So, I mean, there goes 90% of, pre- of uh, PR companies because they just spray and pray, you know, fire and forget, and off it goes. You have to have a pre-existing relationship. Now, if the journalist turns out to be an asshole, they can make an issue well, of it. doesn't it kind of work that way anyway because you know the people that you're sending it to and you kind of have an arrangement, not an arrangement, but you have a respect for each other and you don't send them too much stuff? Well, they kind of, yeah, exactly. You don't want to, it, it, the, the stuff that's really going to move the needle for you is the stuff where people go, that's not just a puff piece. That's not just a profile piece. That means this journalist has done due diligence on this company and they are not just a player in a market, but they're affecting the outcome of the market. So firstly, don't do a press release unless it's, money raised or customers, because it's really just about longevity. Most people's problems with startups is not will you do what you say you do, is will you continue to exist in a year's time? So that's the underlying emotional problem most people have with them. And the other one then is, I don't want to be the first down the chute. I don't want to be the first customer. So get that first customer for a dollar and let them go out and do your PR for you and you know, off you go. Validate. Validate and, and then you know, the rest hopefully will fl- follow. But the main thing is you don't want to, how can I put it? You don't want it to be about your tech. You don't want it to be about your company. Most startups in the first three years are in a hugely vulnerable position and they don't realize it. And actually putting yourself forward is more to your detriment than not. You want to make yourself a part of, assume the sale. You want to be a part of a much bigger, hotter sector. Create the rules for your sector. Like here's the tips for any startup. I was talking to Barry earlier about you know the fintech sector. Write the category rules for that sector. Troll the conference for that sector. Step outside your startup. Put on another hat. I'm I'm in awe of Connor Faulkner in, in AA Roadwatch. The AA are selling me the most boring commodity on the planet: insurance. Once a year, I don't want to think about it. But the Roadwatch. Oh jeez. There might be something on the Logatalia Road. I don't know where the fuck that is. But I'm worried about it. I will let them into my head. Five times a day, I will let those feckers into my head because they give me vaguely interesting information. The daft rental index. Rents are going up. Of course they are. We all know. All right, give me the percentages. I hate it. Oh, so Jesus. Be the, be, the, be the thought leader. Be the thought leader. Okay. It's an awful phrase, but that's what yeah. it is. And, but what you have to do to do that is actually write the rules for your... I'll go back to Havoc as an old story. We were trying to sell physics engines to game developers who didn't want physics engines 15 years ago. And it was PlayStation 2 kind of time. And uh, at the time, you could like stack three crates in a game, and that was considered like the height of. Now they can do a million on a plaything, whatever. But the problem was, it wasn't that they just didn't want our physics; they didn't want physics as a concept. So I wrote the ten rules of physics, really dumbed down my version of it. You know, the engineers were all, "You can't say that; it's not the whatever." I said, "No, no, no. You have to be able to stack ten crates, and you have to be able to have rubber balls and uh, uh, snow and particles and uh, ragdoll forms and whatever." And, we knew we could do two or three of them. We knew our competitors could only do one or two and that the rest were absolute stretch goals that nobody could do. So I knew the journalists would write about that. 
And so we put physics on the map and we put it out through bloggers and uh, other people. Just We set it free. It wasn't the havoc rules of physics. It was the rules of the sector. And when you set that free and people know, okay, this isn't PR anymore. This is a debate on where is the future of this new sector going to go. All of a sudden, physics became important because we'd have clients going to, ah, but what about the 10 laws of physics? And we try not to smile to ourselves because we'd set them free and off they went. It, it's not, is your technology better? It's, why should I give a shit about this whole sector in the first place? And if you can get that debate going, they'll always go to your, because you're the one educating them on, you know, where it is. Then you don't have to sell again, ever. Um, I haven't made a very coherent reason that, but I, I remember is we didn't sell that for two years and then we sold it out the door uh, because of the, like, write the rules of your, step outside your startup. Your startup is boring, you're boring, not you. To your mother, everyone loves you, you're great. But from a PR point of view, it's not your startup, it's not what you're doing, it's you have some market domain expertise that nobody else has. You know where the ball is going to hop in 18 months' time. In fact, you're affecting the trajectory of the ball. And so you have these huge insights and you know you have them. You, you mightn't be aware you have them yet, but you do. If you have the gumption to do a startup or to do a new business, you know, companies are only three things. Talent, and that's binary. You have it or you haven't. We'll only know afterwards. Uh, finance, whether it's raised or uh, generated by yourself. And after that, it's mar market domain expertise. Do you know something about this market that nobody else does that you can get there ahead of time and, you know, you can fit into it. You've got thinner fingers that can reach down into it. And that's where PR lands. Become a good source for those journalists. Give them something away for free, you know, some insight, something that, of course, is obvious to you, but not to anyone else. Journalists are busy. I'm married to a journalist, so I'm not allowed to call them lazy. Journalists are busy. And, uh, but if you can give them those stories, you'll never have to do PR again because they'll just keep coming back to you going, you're the person who's doing this. Throw your own conference and resist the temptation to speak at it. Share it. it. You come across much smarter. I know I'm now coming across dumb and Pat's coming across smart because he's the one asking the questions. I know we're the same intelligence. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> the perception is the other way around. I don't, that's an insult so to it's a bit like It's a bit like Damien Mully doing his conferences and yeah. stepping back and just letting other people... Exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because yeah, yeah, you, you, you elevate yourself so much more uh, in terms of you're controlling what's going on. And in those conferences, it's almost like putting an advisory board together. It's the physical manifestation of a press release. Have two people that everybody in the sector wants to talk about. They probably work for some huge organization anyway that can afford to fly them in. Everyone wants to come to Limerick or Dublin once it's on their bucket list. You can make a profit doing these conferences. And these conferences, by the way, could be 25 people in a hotel room just having coffee. This shouldn't cost you anything. But you know, you've got one or two customers on the panel. You've got one or two thought leaders within the industry. And all of a sudden, off you go. We've got Intercom are a client of ours. And we did an event for them three years ago now um, in the Mansion House. I don't know if anyone was at it, but it was they wanted to own product leadership uh, and, and product Very management. Nice. You know, yeah. Yeah. And it started really as a recruitment event, which of course you can't call a recruitment event a recruitment event. Uh, my friend from CPL will <laughs> back me up on that. Um, so really it was, how can we you know, wrestle away the top 5% of engineers from all the tech companies around Dublin? And it was to own... Um, product, you know, no one really knew it was a nebulous concept in terms of product management and how you do product development and where it would get to. Um, and so they just wanted to own it. Then they went around the world. We did it in London, Paris, Amsterdam, uh, Israel. It was the it was the, the European tour of the Eurovision kind because we ended up in Israel and then back and then filled the Olympia. Now, as a human being, I'm disgusted that tech companies think that they're feckin' rock stars. But as a marketeer, it was a beautiful night when 1,600 people filled the Olympia Amazing. to talk about product management. Yeah. And they've done it around the States, and they're, they're on the third version of it. They're in, uh, get your tickets for Vicker Street. God help us. <laughs> um, Actually, you, you know, should McCabe, McCabe yeah. was a guest oh. in San Francisco. Oh, McCabe was yeah. a guest in San Francisco at yeah. Brian there a few months ago. Um, no, it's, it's amazing. Um, are they going to be the first Irish unicorn? We don't, we don't use the unicorn word. Well, don't use the word, but yeah, yeah. are they going to be? <laughs> I don't know. I, I would say they have People the first have shot. But you know, there's loads up. of Irish unicorns. It, 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 Reiner, Kerry Group. Uh, you know, there's loads of more than one billion valuated well, companies. In, in, kind of in pure tech, tech from startup. Yeah, yeah. I can't think of another. I mean, even if you go back in the old days to um, Chris Horn and uh, the guys, I don't think they ever made the billion. Of course, the billion back then was a lot of money, not like today. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're not there yet. And I know, and I, this isn't me just because I'm their PR guy, I know that's not what motivates them, but uh, they have the best shot of any company I've seen yeah. coming from here. Same. Now, we work for billion dollar companies, but they tend to be US right. and coming yeah. back and, and where they get to. In terms of Ireland and where they're at, but I can see five or six coming behind them. And, and it's not, I think they've led the way to an extent. Now, they've, I'm really interested, especially being here in Limerick, because you can talk about Stripe, you can talk about the guys. Did they need to go to Silicon Valley to do what they did? Probably the VC market isn't big enough. It's not mature enough in terms of what they were going to do. Yeah. Like, 
Intercom is an interesting one because it is both, it is four Irish co-founders. All, they're kind of a reverse multinational in that all heavy development goes on in Dublin and right. San Francisco, where they've raised the money and they are incorporated, right. so they are an American company, but it's, you know, that's, uh, that's where they had to go to raise, I think it's 150 million so far, um, and, and putting it to good use. So their, their growth rates are accelerating. They, I think they're going to be, yeah, they are. But again, that's not what motivates them. They just want to be the best communication platform on the planet for it. And it's interesting because they, they, you know, they got the imprimatur, the, you know, the Slack guys, the Stripe guys, they've all invested personally right. in Intercom because they've taken such a thought leadership position on product management. And what Great they're doing. To be involved with. Yeah, no, it's wonderful, um, and they've taught us a lot more than we do. We're just holding on, <laughs> and trying to help. And that whole thing about being, being driving, you know, for VCs, been driving distance of the meeting. Is that mm. true? Is that really? Do you need to be there to get the serious investment? I I don't know if it's about the driving of the meeting, but yeah, there there it's hard to, yeah, you know, Sandhill Road. It, they can't travel around the world to go to all the you know the meetings that they're going to go to, but there's loads of VC in London. And that's the equivalent of a 30 minute drive, okay. you know, yeah. I mean, and, and that means it's European and it's there. But then you get it backwards as well, like uh, Circle, who are clients of ours, they're actually, you know, they're Boston based, they've raised hundreds of millions, they're, you know, a global force in, in blockchain and, and, uh, and peer to peer. They're an Irish company. They decided to incorporate in Ireland. They thought the legal framework was better. They thought the, you know, that it was, it was a better from a fintech regulatory point of view. And they have all their board meetings including like some of the biggest VCs in the world coming in on their own jets. They have all their board meetings in Dublin. Um, so, you know, it goes both ways. So just going back to conferences, you were involved over the years in, uh, in Web Summit. What's your thoughts on that whole controversy about should Paddy have pulled out or not? And how, how is Lisbon now? Is it just the right thing to do? Is it just obvious? Oh, we should have gone. Are we oversensitive about the whole Look, thing? I, I'm conscious it's been filmed and Paddy Cosgrave is a friend of mine. I love Paddy Cosgrave. <laughs> he should have gone two years ago before he did. Dublin was creaking at the edges. We just didn't realize it because we'd never experienced anything like it. You know, when he got to 20,000 people, Dublin can't host anything more than 20,000 people, bedwise or anything else. So he should have been gone probably before he did. The manner of his leaving, God's sake, whingy little babby, for Christ's sake. <laughs> he should have just owned it and left for proper, you know, grown up reasons. It, but I admire him out the wazoo because it works. It's its own. The feeling I got this year, last year was kind of a bad thing because it was the night Trump was elected. Uh, it was the middle of the cup. We did flounders and I just went, I was wearing a Make America Great hat again and a paddy thing, but I didn't think he was going to win. And then just all the crack went out of it. <laughs> but uh, but um, Lisbon just works. 60,000 people, you wouldn't even know, you know, everything moves around. They have the proper infrastructure. We're not at the races. I mean, we're just not and we shouldn't have. But, you know, Money Conf is coming back and that's a five or 6,000 person conference. It'll probably grow 10 or 12. That's what we are, you know, so go after the verticals and That'll be important to the city. It makes sense, I suppose, in Dublin too at the moment. It does, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Ireland generally. I mean, that's the that's what I always want, because you know, it took me an hour and a half to drive here today. That's the length of Silicon Valley. San Francisco to San Jose is an hour and a half. Like, so sometimes I think we have small rockitis. You know, I'm looking at John who just came back from Silicon Valley. Like, it's, 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 this is a commute. Now, maybe we don't want that to be a commute, but we think it's, uh, Cork is going to pull one over on Galway, which is going to pull one over, and everybody's going to pull We're a medium capital city in Dublin with really much more interesting satellite cities around us, and then a good bit of a theme park beyond that. <laughs> you know, theme park for Germans, uh, basically, in Kerry and well, West Cork. That, that thing before uh, about you had to be in the valley, you know, and then yeah. Dublin people realised that you could stay in Dublin. Yeah. To an extent, this, that ripple effect has happened in Cork and it Galway did. and Limerick. People yeah. are saying, I, used to have, I mean, I even know myself, I used to have to go to Dublin all the time to events, but now they're happening no, here. Exactly. You know. And not even the events, and, and the lifestyle and the job. And I know it's, I, I don't mean this is patronizing because, you know, I'm a culture. I'm more culture than you. This is a city. <laughs> I didn't grow up in a city. But, like, I know, like, my friends, uh, Peter Kyo uh, and we see McAllister down there, Sir Sweeney, like, all my mates are from Limerick. It's like, some of my best friends are <laughs> dodgy geezers. And I know their lifestyle is, because, again, much like you, they're not smarter than me, but they have a much better lifestyle living here than I do, breaking me whatever's. Uh, in Dublin, and you just got to make that choice. Um, and I realized, you know, that you, you can, you have a much better lifestyle, you have much more purchasing power, you've, you know, a, a hell of a better commute, you've got the lake, you've got Shannon, you've got everything around it, like, you're not missing it. And in fact, I think, I, I see my brother at home as well, he enjoys Dublin more than I do, because he'll come up, you know, once or twice a month, go to a show, get shit-faced, you know, go and have a great meal. And I go, oh, I can only do that once a month. And I live in, I, it's like I walk past it. You know, you're not missing anything. You're really not. 
Anyway, sorry. Uh, back to the other, uh, the PR. Oh yeah, PR tips. So never talk about yourself, only talk about your sector. Become an expert on your sector. Uh, become the spokesperson. Almost be schizophrenic. You know, put step outside your company into your sector and become the absolute expert on that. Set up an association, a trade thing. Something that gives you perceived objectivity. And then the quality of what you do with journalists will be so much more uh, appreciated and, and, and get there. And never go with one story. Have the six stories because you have to have an arc and it has to land somewhere. And, you know, you build trust by going, do you remember we said we do that? We just did it. Do you remember we said we do that? You know, customers, employees, whatever benchmark you want. The only advantage you have as a startup is you get to write the rules for your own success. Not ultimately, because you either have run out of money or you have money, but you can write all the other criteria for your own success. So you can decide that it is customers or market share or you know whichever way you're going to get to. Because you feck it, everything else is going against you. You know, you've only got a one in ten chance of succeeding. So you know, try and frame it so that you know it's easier. You know, to to go the rest of the way. And um, again, people remember how you make them feel. They remember very little of what you're actually saying. Your brand is the three to five words that I think Bezos said it. Three to five words that people use about you after you've left the room. Your name doesn't matter. Your tagline doesn't matter. I'm being facetious here to make a point. Name your sector, and you'll never have to get out of bed early again. Like, and that's like you know, it's like the Hollywood thing of it's Cinderella meets Jaws. There is some intersection of your sector and your expertise, and if you can name that and get people talking about that as a sector. Then the first thing they're going to do is, well, show me the proof of this. Oh, that little company there. I wasn't even going to talk about that. But yeah, yeah, that's the company that's the proof of this bigger sector. So, you know, with Intercom, it was communications and where it's going to take us and how it should work and where it would get to. Uh, I see Mr. Sweeney down there. It's probably going to be voice after that. Uh, I mean, it is already. It's inevitable that it's going to be voice and that it's going to be. Um, anyway, that that's kind of the, I know it's easy for me to say that and kind of arrogant for me to say that, but you all have a shot to do that and become a good source for a journalist. Just remember who they write for. First their editor, and then for a very broad swathe of people. So most PR and communications is wasted, but that's okay, do it anyway, because it's like an amplification light. You know, you broadcast in order to narrowcast. So the, the, the 800,000 that read the Sunday Independent Business section, or well, they don't read the business section, they probably stop at the magazine, and they, whatever way they go on to, most of them are irrelevant to your business. But to the 500 people or 1,000 people or 5,000 people you're trying to get to, it's much more uh, impactful because they know a million people have read it. And they go, well, sure, someone would have caught these fellas out if they were chancers. Uh, it's, it's, it's due diligence by mass market is really what PR is. The other thing is don't get bullshitted by PR companies telling you. It's half of our stuff is qualitative and half of it is quantitative. And I can game the quantitative, let me tell you. I can give you 200 million Chinese people who will never buy anything from you and I can make your metrics look really good <laughs> in terms of Chinese TV or whatever it's going to be. It's not about the numbers. It's did it emotionally resonate with the actual core you're trying to get to. Some of the, um, I mean, trade press isn't sexy. It isn't cool. It isn't whatever. That's where the needle moves in terms of customer acquisition. And really how social has impacted on top of that. I mean, the plural of anecdote isn't data, but as a PR guy, I kind of think it is, <laughs> you know, like you can give me all the data in the world, but actually three strong anecdotes that resonate with me emotionally, I'll believe that over any chart or any, you know, whatever else you give me. Um, I found the journalists, it's, everything's moving to social. Everything's moving to your own content, but it can't move there on its own and it'll never be the totality of what you're doing. Um, there's a, a probably true way of story. John Collins, I don't know if anyone here yeah. knew him, but John was the tech editor of the Irish Times for a long time. And then he was deputy editor of the Irish Times. He moved off and did some stuff. And three or four years ago, he came and said, Intercom want to hire me as their managing editor. And he goes, what's the managing editor? <laughs> because there wasn't that kind of thing around yeah, at the yeah. time. It was very progressive of them. And what John does brilliantly, in my mind, is he produces a newspaper for Intercom once a month. Um, kind of that level of content and what it's got. 70 or 80% interesting stuff, you know? Uh, and he does it through all different media, from yeah. cartoons to LinkedIn to Twitter to whatever else, but, and, and all different types of media. But 70 or 80% of it is, here's interesting stuff to the devs that we're trying to attract. Right. And 20% of it is likely veiled advertorial. That's how you do social, in whatever way you're going to do. Yeah. He's basically producing a newspaper, and that's the newspaper model. We will entertain you, educate you, inform you, and you'll read about 20 or 30% ads. 
and that's the deal. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. It, as a as a philosophy and as what he, he's got two hundred fifty thousand people reading the Intercom blog. That's five times as many read the Irish Times. Wow. Like it's it's like the scale is is phenomenal. And they're doing an interesting thing as well, which is what Stripe did. They're going. We see the existing internet. I just love the arrogance of that. You know, ten to fifteen percent of global commerce is online right now. We don't want it. Like we want the next fifteen percent that's coming in the next five years. We want the devs in the bedroom. You know that are going to uh, that haven't invented their company yet. So that's why they're they look like they're almost selling at a you know that's a bit cut rate or that's a bit you know where you no we just want to grow with companies that don't exist yet because we know that'll be bigger than the people who've been using PayPal for the last ten years or you know whatever other so st- legacy systems. Storytelling is important, and the Irish are good at story- telling stories, right? Ah, yeah. What are we what are we bad at in the country? You know, from from a tech point of view, what what should we be doing better? I mean, mm-hmm. the big funding VC is obviously uh, an issue. You have to go to London or, 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 or yeah, but you know, early big, stage big money, I think we're as good as anywhere. Like EI, they don't like saying it is the biggest VC in Europe. Yeah. You know, and then all the other bits that fall out of it. So I mean, if you need, if 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 you're if you want to take a year of your life and try and do a startup, I would say this is one of the easiest places on the planet to do it. I mean, there are 50Ks falling out of everywhere. But like, you can't get in the States, right? No, yeah. they don't. Like, they don't yeah. have that early stage. Now, again, maybe it's because, you know, they've, they've moved on beyond that to an extent and there, there's a lot more angels. So, I mean, we don't have the angel thing because everyone put their money in hotels and property and that shit didn't work out. And, you know, we're still working it out. Um, so we haven't had that, you know, and where it went to. The tax environment is still atrocious. It's like, ah, your chancers. It's like a post-colonial tax environment. You know, it's like they're still the Brits. <laughs> and everyone, and, and entrepreneurs and capitalists are trying to catch us out. <laughs> and we'll get them. Um, I just think that'll loosen over time and get there. But right now it's punitive. Like, go offshore. Put that on camera. Go offshore. Fuck them. <laughs> like, it's not, you know, set it up somewhere else. I'll tell you a great story. I oh, know I can't actually. But I, uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a great story in the pub later. Like, I saw a guy on TV going, when he was asked after he sold his company, um, you know, uh, what about the 30% capital gains and the other stuff and whatever, he leaned in and went, it's not only my duty, it's an honour to do that. I was in a lot of meetings with him where he tried to get out of it. (laughs) But you can't. Uh, But anyway, uh, yeah. I think the entrepreneurial drive is, is amazing and it will start to loosen. Uh, around the edge. I don't know what we do wrong or right. I mean, I, I'm the guy who kicked Angry Birds off our bus. That was the other thing. I haven't a clue. I have no clue. I've never made money from shares. I've never made money from equity. I am adjacent to these guys. I don't take equity in any of the companies because I never know which ones are going to go and I'm just barely surviving, you know, doing the whatever. They wouldn't offer it anyway. Um, uh, but I, I will tell you this story. Seven years, I was at this game developers conference in San Jose, and we used to hire a trolley bus and drive it around the McInerney Convention Center and do whatever. And every year, these guys would get on the bus and they'd go, oh, good to see you, Irish guy. How are you? And this is our game this year. And I go, you're great fun, but you're drinking our beer. You know what I mean? Like, and, it's, and if you are drinking our beer, you're adding to the gaiety and we like you and whatever. And then after seven years, they said, no, you see, this is, uh, and we were, again, we were physics Snobs, you know, because we were like about how far could you put phys- push physics? Trinity graduates. Trinity, oh yeah, well they were, I wasn't. I obeyed my bishop. Uh, but anyway, they were going, uh, I was going, I was, and then they went, no, you don't understand. I go, because I'm not sure where they finish or Swedish. <laughs> but they were going, no, the pigs, they're angry with the birds. <laughs> and the birds will, they will, from anger, they will bust the bees. And then I'm going, that's shite. That's, that's like a, that'll never catch on. That's like a <laughs> physics demo from 10 years ago. That, like, I was looking at it technically, going, that's for simpletons, like three-year-olds, mice, and then well, get off the bus. Get, get off the bus. <laughs> Where are you going? And what I didn't realize was we don't work in a static environment. What changed was Angry Birds is still a shit game, but it's a compelling game. And here's why, uh, well, not just because it's simple physics, the iPad and the iPhone, uh, which uh, soon after, added it took it took 40 years to get to half a billion gamers from atari pong to playstation 3 we'll say and then in a year apple added another half billion gamers and they were 55 year old nebraskan housewives and they would never self-identify as gamers but they were gamers they were playing words with friends scrabulous angry birds and i don't know something else that we as game snobs would be going oh for god's sake that's not a game that's why angry birds was a huge hit Because half a billion people who didn't know anything about games needed something to distract themselves. The platform came along at the right time 
for a shitty game, for a shitty enough game, but an easy game. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's why I don't know any, like it seems to me sometimes that you can't be arrogant as an entrepreneur because half the time it's something you had no clue about shifted and you got lucky. Uh, because of that. That's where the product market fit happened because some new, so some kid sitting in Ireland, like we've never been able, I, I set up Games Ireland with uh, another guy, Dave Sweeney, for a couple of years. And again, I don't play games. I'm like a drug dealer. Don't take your own stuff. <laughs> like I have no interest in games. But it was great fun. It was all in California. Sure, what are you going to have yourself? Um, we've never had a hit game come out of Ireland. We've never had it. And, you know, it's almost impossible to legislate for or back or where it gets to. But some kid is sitting somewhere probably five miles from here and on some AR platform that hasn't been even invented yet, he'll put a silly little thing up and it'll be the next Angry Birds. Um, you know, he'll be the next Supercell. It'll get there. So tinker, maker sessions, anything that can get people tinkering and where they get to and how they get to, like whatever happened to the Collison boys, drink the water out and drum an ear. And, and by the way, as you and I both know, they might've got their learning in Limerick. But those boys are Tipperary lads. Stop claiming them. Stop claiming them. They grew up in fucking drum an ear, right? That's it. I, I, had right. to, I had to introduce Patrick to stage right. in, uh, in San Francisco last year. And I'm very aware of that. You know, yeah, from, thank you. From ball hopping online, mostly from you probably, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Because yeah. Limerick do claim them. Of and course. Obviously they they, yeah, they yeah. grow up in tip. So out of respect, because I was introducing him to a big, a big uh, uh, audience in the theatre, I said to him in advance, I said, Patrick, because I'm the startup grind Limerick yeah, chapter yeah, yeah. guy, and they've asked me to introduce you. Do you mind if I introduce you from Limerick? He said, oh yeah, sure, that's the last place I went to school and lived. Yeah. But, but I thought he might turn around and go, no, I'm a tip guy. And no, he doesn't seem to have the same kind of, uh, yeah. I like to see the tip colours up here for the blues, so that's a nice <laughs> question. I do appreciate that. They, uh, they, they, you know, uh, Paul Quigley slagged me off the whole time with Clang to Virus from News Whip. And, uh, Limerick man. Limerick man, yeah. And uh, there's an awful lot of Limerick going He was through. here too, I guess. Yeah. yeah. No, he's brilliant. Paul's great. Yeah, he was beaten up a lot on the way home from school, so I think that's what motivated him as an entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, he would say that, what are you doing, uh, you know? What's in the bag? You're learning? <laughs> Come here, watch you. Give me two bob for a bed. I'll kick the heart out of you. He does a very good... Uh, I don't think that's his original accent, but he can do a good Limerick accent, yeah. Um, yeah. Paul's good. I just realised, because my, my Apple Watch the battery's gone, because it's a crap battery. I have no, no, no clue what time it is. We're just going kind of like over, so... I, can I tell you a quick yeah. question? Apple Watch, can I tell you a quick question? Let me talk pretty someday. Tell me a quick question. Uh, I, I now cycle. Don't let the belly fool you. Uh, they're quite strong shoulders and legs. Um, like so midlife crisis, Lycra, the whole thing. Everyone's cycling. Nobody plays golf anymore. Now it's what gets you from 45 to 65, then you can play golf. So every VC in the Valley is cycling. I think it's pain, and I think it's that our partners, male or female, think, well, at least you're in pain. Fuck, you can do it for a few hours. Off you go. Not so bad in the knees. But, yeah, not so bad in the knees. But anyway, I decided I would bring all the guys who had, I call them the Irish billionaires, and anyone who's had a hundred million exit in Ireland, because they, you know, the 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 hustle world guys and the the car trawler guys and um, um, now factory and a few more. And we were all cycling together, and we'd done all these charity cycles. Um, Parsonies is a great one. I would recommend anyone to do that. I went on it cynically because it was all full of techies, but it actually changed my life. It was great fun, about six years ago. Anyway, started cycling, and then they all went, this is wonderful, it's for the kids, charity, wonderful. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do a decadent cycle? So I put together the most decadent cycle on the planet in Napa. Uh, we did three three-star Michelins before we got on the bike for three nights in a row. These lads had money to spend. I didn't. I like being adjacent. I don't know why. Uh, but anyway, we did. And basically, Michelin star restaurants are basically just posh stags because the food is all despair wrapped in whimsy, but it's nine courses of wine. You're flummoxed like. And we did it three nights in a row. And then I went and bought an iWatch. Big mistake. Started showing me my heartbeat. So I got on the bike in March and I'd never cycled like in six months. And I'd been on three stags, basically, posh stags. Uh, and then my heartbeat kept going up and up and up. And luckily, uh, you might know him an entrepreneur, Dr. Johnny Walker, the best named entrepreneur on the planet. He's an Aussie, an inventor. And he was on the cycle with us. He goes, hey, Izzy, that doesn't look right. I think your eye watch, or I think your, your, your watch is broken. And I said, why? It's 200 a piece per minute. Is that a lot, Johnny? And he goes, Jesus, hey, Izzy, yeah. Be <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not good. And I said, well, what, what do we do? So he said, all right, all right. There's a hospital uh, 10 miles that way. Let's go. So he says, uh, so we peeled off the back. We didn't even tell anyone. I just thought I was dying. And uh, it just turned out I was dehydrated from too much drinking. Peeled off, arrived into this hospital in Sebastopol in the Russian River. And we pull up to the door at five o'clock, Lycra, no ID, no nothing. And Johnny goes, Drunk. yeah, no, 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 no. Well, hungover. And uh, Johnny goes, how are you? To the receptionist. Firstly, he said, my name's Dr. Johnny Walker. I'm a real doctor. <laughs> Not <to> real. <laughs> That was his first mistake. Just like, because seemingly doctors don't normally go, I'm a real doctor. 
Oh, there he goes. And my friend Hazy is having a heart attack. <laughs> is there? And I'm going, oh, Jesus, am I? I didn't realize I was until that point. And, uh, and he goes, is there any chance we can hook him up with your old EKG? And she goes, no, no, you can't. And then around the corner comes a robo doc, an iPad on wheels, which was the doctor who'd gone home, the real doctor, <laughs> not like my real doctor. And uh, she was at home sitting in her couch in Marin, drinking a drop of wine, going, who the hell are you guys? And Johnny's shaking the, I, Hazy's dying. <laughs> you got to let him in. At this stage, I just took the iWatch off. <laughs> it's gone somewhere. I had an iWatch for 24 hours, but it didn't suit me. Uh, Obviously. I know, at all. But uh, go and cycle with those guys is good. Yeah, it's how you get an angel network going. And, you know, yeah. Sounds great. Yeah. So this is only the second time in two years that we've gone a half an hour over. So I think it's testament to uh, Paul's storytelling skills. Points are on so, me. Uh, no, I'll pass. <laughs> Thanks a million, Paul. Not at all. Pretty nice. Thank you. Thank you.